lot of processing. My, uh, my first intuition about that was, way back when I wrote my first anti-AI paper, was that they hadn't noticed that though they thought there was a lot of calculating going on in chess in the middle game, that they thought that uh, at first you just made plausible moves. And what, what does that mean, a plausible move? So the question is, do you just calculate unconsciously the plausible moves and then start thinking out like a computer step by step the, the other ones? I don't think that's important. Let me see, try to say it better. Uh, um, Okay, we just, we, we, the, the tradition has said since the beginning that skills are, ju are unconscious rules, that as you acquire a skill, you get subtler and subtler, subtler rules, but that the rules uh, go un to your unconscious and you don't have to think about them anymore. And that's what it is to be an expert. That, I guess I have to tell a funny story here because that sounds very plausible if you say the following, which an AI expert systems guy said in a book you when you learn to tie your shoelaces you had to follow a rule and you had to put and you had to know that you put this on top of that and then you made a loop of this and then you put that through of course I'm just making this up I have no idea what rule they told me but after you tied lots of shoelaces you don't remember the rule anymore but you couldn't tie the shoelaces if you didn't have this a rule and so you must have the rules that must have must have gone unconscious that's, I thought when I heard it, that's a great joke. That's like saying the following. When you learn to ride a bicycle, you had to have training wheels and you couldn't ride the bicycle without training wheels. So look at this. Now you can take off the wheels and still ride the bicycle. The wheels must have become invisible. Uh, the, the, the point is, maybe there's just an entirely different brain process involved when you needed the training wheels and when you had the rules for tying the shoelaces than you have once you got tied lots of shoelaces or ridden, uh, 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 learned to ride a bicycle. But the funny story doesn't, doesn't disprove it. No, no, okay, it doesn't disprove it. You're not going to ever disprove it, but here's more convincing but you do evidence. Kind of by, 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 by talking about how oh, the regress. Was taking okay, well, let's, the okay, one more thing about. before the, the possible proof of it. Uh, that is, Stuart and I actually did an experiment. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, you got, yeah, okay. But uh, how, true, okay. having this kind of uh, joke doesn't prove it, but it sort of liberates your mind from the idea that it must be the case that you still have an unconscious rule when you tie your shoelaces. But then we tried an experiment. We had Julio Kaplan, who was junior world chess champion before he became a graduate student, do the following sort of uh, torture we, uh, on him. We got him to listen to beeps on, on headphones that, and add them up. So he'd hear beep, beep, and beep, 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 or just plain beep, and he'd have to say three, seven, eight, and was just counting them. And then, while he was counting them, and without slowing down, without making mistakes, we got him to play chess with another chess master. And the interesting thing is, he could do it. Because the, the part of his mind that we, were to, that we were occupying, his sort of analytic, calculating, computer-like part of his mind, was not necessary for the chess playing, and the, because the chess playing was clearly perceptual. He could just see what to do. Oh, that's, that's related to the fact, another way, that, that's an, it, that experiment was interesting because it seems to rule out or suggest that there's no unconscious analytic going on because we've tried to jam his left hemisphere and his analytic with his counting. And the idea that it's all done by perception is you can see it in chess in two ways. One, a chess master can play let's just say 30 different chess games at once, going from each one in, a, in, a, in, say, Central Park, and just looking at the board and making a move. He hasn't time to reconstruct the history of the game or what his strategy in that, with that game was, and he doesn't have to. If he sees a, a board position, he has seen enough. That he has seen about a million board positions before he becomes a grandmaster, Julio Kaplan told me a few weeks ago when I asked him. They play the chess and master like he is, when they become one, have to play many, 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 many games, over and over games in books and over and over in tournaments, all day practically. And then he did this calculation and he said, gee, I must have done a million games. 
But and still they haven't seen that exact position never, before. Never, never. But the brain is capable of generalizing a little bit from any given position to a similar position, apparently. And the more refined he, they get, the, the better. Now, I have to make an aside about Stuart, or I'll forget it. What I said that he learned something about chess from being the head of the, the captain of the Harvard chess team, but never being a master. When he, being an analytic mathematician, decided that he had to understand why, in each case, the grandmaster made the move he made when he was reading these uh, books of great chess games. And he tried to figure out what rule the master was following. And he couldn't, and it was very frustrating, and he never managed to read through or get through a book. And he noticed, but he didn't understand what it meant, that, all, that his f teammates weren't asking themselves any questions at all. They were just reading through the books and watching what was happening, what moves the, the master was making. Well, now we know why. They were building up this repertoire of moves, and they were, they had, they were smart enough to have seen that there were not going to be any rules. Now let's go back to this, why, why can we be sure that there are not going to be any rules, which you were, you were asking me about. No, I have to say one more thing. The, the final perceptual argument that, he, that it's not done by unconscious rules, uh, besides a philosophical argument, there is an empirical argument that a chess, they can play chess grandmasters, something called blitz chess, or even faster, something called lightning chess, where they have to play at a move a second, and yet they can play grand master level games. And now, the brain c computes very slowly, and it couldn't comp compute even two or three moves in a second. The brain, and at its maximum, it can only compute two or three hundred moves, so the, the it's clear the chess master is responding just immediately to the perception of the position on the, on the board. The one chess master I heard on the radio said that when he's running out of time in a tournament, he, his hand goes out and makes a move before he has time even consciously to take in the board. And that must be happening all the time if you're playing lightning chess. You're, it's just you're looking at the board and your hand is making moves. And the board is calling for... A yeah, the shot. board is calling for a certain move in your, to your body. Now, your mind has long ago left, been, been left behind. Of course, your brain is still involved, but your conscious reflective thinking is irrelevant. It would slow you down. You couldn't, you'd lose every game of lightning chess. Uh, you'd have to stop and think. Uh, so, uh, but now, it, it, another way to think about it, besides sort of empirically it would be impossible to play chess uh, using the kind of computation that a computer uses. Look at, because they look, I remember looking at a million moves a second in order to make a grandmaster level move. It's just out of the question. But it's also true that, there, that when each move is so specific, there's so much that you would have to account for if you were doing it analytically, where all the pieces were, what stage of the game you were at, whether you were on the defensive or offensive, whether the other player was an aggressive player or, or a cautious player, and so forth. You, the, and, and each of those would require another bunch of backgrounds. How do you define cautious and offensive? How do you recognize whether it's a cautious or defensive player? How do you recognize whether uh, this is the moment in the game in which it's time to take the offensive? And each of the recognitions would require stuff to recognize it, which would require more recognitions. So you would, as a, a student of mine said, have to know sort of economics in order to go to the supermarket and buy a pack of cigarettes. The, the, all these factors of, would be something you'd take it, you'd have to unconsciously be taking account of. And of course, so there's empirical evidence we couldn't do it with our kind of brain. There's the kind of philosophical argument that you'd get a regress of conditions and rules for recognizing things and then conditions and rules for recognizing whatever you needed to recognize that and blah, 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 just so you never would get started. Uh, this is a Wittgensteinian argument. If you, you, it, you, if you needed rules to apply rules, you, you couldn't ever start because you've got to, at some level, just see what to do. Now, I want to use this, all this amazing model, now to make a, a I mean, Someone I was telling this story to made, said, oh, well, then he's just like a behaviorist. You know, he thinks we're just like machines, you know, just acting. 
this like there's a kind of negative way of looking at the uh, uh, like acting. That's good. Unconsciously is the wrong word. Yeah. Because obviously it's not right. unconsciously, right. but in this way. Yeah, like the kind of takes away associationist. Meaning. It's kind of like a mechanistic associationist. Right. Model. So yeah. I want to draw a contrast between obviously what you're talking about, which is kind of a, you know more not romantic but i you know i like this holistic view that we're, we're being uh, receptive to the needs of the world we're understanding so much things at once we're you know we're, we're kind of complex we're giving meaning both to the uh the to objects and situations and to our own lives and identity and i know it's a lot to tackle but i think it's important that we make a distinction between saying okay well we're just mechanistically behaving in the world meaninglessly yeah and the beautiful, rich meaning that we are giving to all this model of the way we behave. Yeah. Can Things you? That, I can't get up. Oh, you can't either. Never. I can get up. I can either of us can oh, get up. Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you need? I want to get some 